Hello, and welcome to the first supplementary lecture for our GIS for Geoscientists workshop series. The goal of these supplementary lectures is to extend on the concepts and some of the perhaps very short tips and tricks I'll show during the live sessions in extended video format. So while I know you're all busy and I really appreciate your attention in the main sessions, I will ask that you try your best to watch these videos, even if you watch them while you have something else on in the background. I think it can only do you good to hear a bit more beyond the main lessons I'm trying to get across. So this first supplementary lecture is concerned with why you might, as an earth, science, earth scientist, use GIS. This might seem like a strange topic to cover in this course. You've all opted in to sign up. Um, so you clearly have some inkling of GIS being important or a skill that you want to learn or a tool that you want to apply to a particular problem. So this might seem a bit irrelevant. But what I have found is that even though almost every earth scientist knows what GIS is and knows ways it can be used, they don't really appreciate the different ways it can be applied to their work and the real extent of the value it adds to anything you're working on in earth science. So that's the goal of this lecture series here is just to provide you a bit more context for why we care about GIS and why we put ourselves through the, the often painful experience of learning GIS. Um, though I will say the goal of this entire workshop is to make that experience slightly less painful. <laughs> so four reasons to use GIS. I'm going to touch on all of these at varying length. The first one I'm going to start with is the one probably at the forefront of most of the early career researchers' minds in this workshop, and that's job prospects. With regards to job prospects, I provided some statistics on the screen here, but the key thing to get, get away from this slide in this section is that GIS specialists have an employment rate that outstrips average employment growth in the UK and in the US. This is a, a trend that is expected to grow in the coming years across the world, not just in nations like the US and the UK, but everywhere. The specific stats that I've shown in the slide here are specific to the US and the UK, uh, but I'm sure if wherever you're from, if, if you take the time to look up these types of statistics, you'll find similar information. The geospatial industry, just by the sheer amount of data that we have access to now as part of the global economy, is becoming a bigger and bigger employer of people in all sorts of different fields and disciplines. Um, I mean, pretty much any company these days has someone working in, in a geospatial capacity, and there are lots of employment opportunities for people who know how to use geospatial Softwares alongside other technical skills like programming or uh, specialist software skills. And the Geological Society of London, one of the sponsors of this workshop, has highlighted that GIS, alongside programs, you know, software programs and drawing programs, are essential skills for future geologists. Now, the skills I've highlighted and the, the sort of reasoning I've highlighted is definitely geared towards people with a private or public sector mindset who might be pursuing careers outside of academia. And that's where you're really going to see a lot of the value of GIS. But for my research and academia friends, I don't want you to think that it's a waste of your time to learn GIS. And it's only something that matters if you're go, just deciding to leave university and not do research in a, in a university context. Learning GIS takes time, and no matter where you go or what you're doing, that's going to translate to value for the organization you're working for, whether that's a big Fortune 500 company, whether it's for your country's or region's government, or whether you're joining a research team. The fact that you have this skill set is going to add value and potential uh, employability to any application you're going to submit. The way I see it is that if you're positioning yourself as a geologist, who knows how to use GIS really in any capacity, you increase your utility anyway, because you can work on problems well outside your discipline because you have the basic fundamental technical skills that allow you to work on all sorts of different topics. Personally, I found during my undergraduate, I was actually required to do internships. And I did an internship with a hydrogeology company. Quite a ways away from volcanology, where all of my research and interests really lie, but I found that just having a basic skill set in GIS made me incredibly valuable to them 
And I was always given great projects and kind of great work to do because I was able to use the software, something that most of the people at that company vaguely knew how to do, but didn't really know how to leverage to its full capacity. Uh, and that, this is going to be one of the goals of the workshop is to make sure that you can get the skill across and use it in a variety of contexts to make yourself as valuable as possible. So that's job prospects. The next reason you might want to use GIS is to advance your analysis. And what I provided on the screen here are a selection of different potential reasons why you might want to use GIS in different contexts. There are obviously interdisciplinary reasons as well. I don't mean to just break down things into such neat categories, but it made making the slide a bit easier. Um, the commonality between all of these different advances that GIS can provide to different analyses is that it often provides an, uh, a much clearer description of the impact of a particular process or event on either the environment, the land surface or ocean surface, or a human population center. That's one of the commonalities across all of these is that uh, uh, applying GIS in these circumstances really allows you to illustrate the impact. And so if you think about writing a grant proposal or writing a paper, you could imagine these types of analyses would be you know, enhanced by having a GIS-aided calculation, maybe near the end where you're highlighting the broader impacts of your work. Um, or if you're in the private sector and you're doing a site report on you know, a new mine or a new water well that you're drilling, GIS is going to be integral in conveying the impact that this project is going to have on the community and the local ecosystem. I now want to give you an example from my own research. I think speaking from my own experience will uh, is the way I'm the most confident talking about these things. Uh, and this comes from a paper that uh, I published back in August. Me and my co-authors co got published in uh, Geochemica Cosmemica. Um, and this is concerning a database that I made uh, that's really become a central kind of component of my PhD thesis. And that's this database called, that I've called Arc Metals. Um, the idea behind this database was I wanted to be able to investigate generic processes that control the chemical evolution of magmas and subduction zones. Um, this has been done before in different capacities. And a common way to approach this is to download a lot of different petrological data from GeoRock, which is for any igneous petrologist or volcanologist out there, you probably know GeoRock. It's a good first port of call when you're trying to get background data on a particular pluton or volcano or arc segment. You tend to just download these CSV files and then try to work with the sometimes not very well organized data sets to get some general background information. So GeoRock is a great tool. I mean, I would say that up front. It is an amazing tool and a compilation uh, that requires a ton of work from lots of very dedicated and motivated people. But it's limited in that it's mainly chemical information is what it gets across. So if you're just using GeoRock on its own, you're limited in the number of hypotheses you can make and the, and the avenues you can take in understanding a particular research question. So what I wanted to do was to combine the insights from GeoRock with lots of different geophysical data sets. Um, these include you know, things like slab thermal structure, the actual physical location of the slab in the crust with respect to the volcano, crustal thickness and rheology, the types of sediments going into subduction zones. I wanted to get a real holistic geophysical data set combined with GeoRock. And the easiest way to do that is using GIS. I mean, it really was an operation that did not take that much time. It took me, you know, a day or two to really work this out in, in any great amount of detail. And what comes out the other side is actually these plots shown on the right, they're quite complicated. And I don't have time here or really the right to explain these in any great detail um, because I'm gonna be presenting on these plots actually at the American Geophysical Union meeting in December, which is a bit of a shameless plug there. Um, but what came out of this compilation is the recognition of a geochemical signal that we would have missed if we hadn't included things, uh, geophysical information like depth of slab. So we were able to identify this geochemical feature of subduction zone magmas, namely these, these anomalous peaks in what we believe are slab dehydration signatures um, by comparing geochemical data to this geophysical data all in the same place. And it all came thanks to GIS. This would have been a lot more difficult in, to do in other sort of more manual ways. Could have been done, but GIS made it very simple and took less than a week to get all this together 
um, and start making these inferences. So hopefully that gives you a sense for the kind, the ways that you can uh, enhance your analysis and build on your models to give greater value to your results. Um, and I will say that the type of operation that's involved in transplanting geophysical data onto geochemical data sets or, or really point data in general, I'm going to show you how to do that. It's a process called sampling, and that'll come in in probably session three of the workshop. So you'll be able to learn to do basically the same thing I did here. All right, that's number two. So now on to number three, we have making data reusable. And this is my real soapbox. This is the issue I, I really care most about with regards to how GIS adds value to the work you want to do as an earth scientist. And the reason I care about this so much is because it's a really underappreciated aspect of GIS. Everything we do as earth scientists is spatial. No, it doesn't matter whether you're a planetary scientist or whether you're a sedimentologist or a paleobiologist or a volcanologist, everything you're doing is that with some respect to space. That's why we care about what we do, we, why we study the earth, we care about space and place. And often, not all the time, but often spatial metadata is not thought of or treated with the same care as metadata that might come from an instrument or might come from a particular model. You know, people will be very detailed in reporting model parameters for some you know, machine learning model. But the spatial, the underlying spatial metadata isn't often thought about in the same, with the same care. Um, and this, again, this isn't to say that everyone does this. There are lots of people, especially in particular subfields of earth sciences, who are really good at reporting good spatial metadata. Um, but I'll, I'll use another example from my own research to highlight how not thinking about this uh, in some contexts can, can lead to problems and how it can really limit the applicability of your work. Really by not thinking about spatial data and using GIS to provide people with the spatial metadata they need to replicate your analyses, you're doing a disservice to yourself more than anyone because it makes it harder to actually cite your work and use it to build on uh, any sort of finding that you, that you have. Now, the example I'm gonna give is not, doesn't really fit that mold as much. This is an example of an older, not, not pre-computers, but pre-modern computers uh, compilation that was not designed for modern GIS applications. And as a result, when, it wanted, when people wanted to investigate it in modern you know, 2010s and onward um, age, it was difficult to actually get the data you need out of it. Um, so what, uh, the reason I give that caveat at the beginning is that this is an excellent map and an excellent data set that I'm gonna be talking about. But it was designed in an age when this wasn't, it wasn't possible to really think about spatial metadata in the same way that I'm gonna talk about it here. Because computers just weren't as advanced as they are now, even 21 years ago, I mean, think about what computers were like then. Um, so this, the map in particular is a very pretty map, like a lot of geological maps, lots of different colors and shapes going on here. This map shows the chemostratigraphy of the Deccan basalts in central and western India. And this is a compilation map. This is the first key thing to recognize. This is a map that took an immense amount of work from two of the leading experts on the Deccan Traps, which are a large igneous province in central India. Um, these, these folks, Subaru and Hooper, they pulled together decades of field and laboratory work on the Deccan Traps to map the spatial extent of the different formations that have been recognized and commonly accepted within the Deccan Traps. Um, this is a really important, this was a really important step to kind of make this compilation because it allowed people to think about the spatial scale of different packages of lava in the Deccan Traps. Um, this, th this has all sorts of applications. I'm not gonna to try to get into all the sort of intricacies of why we care about this, but you should hopefully be able to recognize that there's a lot of value in knowing where these lava flows are, what their aerial extent is, and you know, uh, where we can find them. If say, I just wanna you know, get some polypore lava flow in, uh, samples, this map is great for that, but uh, more importantly, it's great for bigger scale analyses of, of the scale of the Deccan Traps and the effect that it had on the ecosystem. So great map made by experts who knew what they were doing, so we can trust that it's quite accurate in terms of how it was assembled. But the thing that makes this map difficult to work with is that it doesn't provide one key feature, and that is a projection system. 
Now, we are going to talk about this more in session one. So if you're watching this before session one, don't worry too much about what I mean by a projection system at the moment. We're going to have plenty of time over the rest of the workshop series to go into the intricacies of projection systems and datums and reference systems. Um, but, but for now, what to know is th these map makers, given that they were making it in the physical volume in the year 2000, they, didn't, they probably didn't involve lots of computational techniques in making this map. Perhaps they did behind the scenes, but in the final form, it was definitely hand drawn or made in a graphics design software. It wasn't made in a GIS software. And as a result, this map comes away not having a key piece of spatial metadata that tells us the, the degree of distortion that this map experienced being created. Because even if this map was hand drawn, there had to have been some base reference for it. And that base reference, no matter where it came from or what its source, given that, it, that that reference would have had to take data from what is our 3D Earth and flatten it down to a 2D map, involves some distortion. And without a description of the projection system, the method they use to get from 3D to 2D, the authors here are not providing us with the information we need to actually estimate the degree of uncertainty with which we place you know, the polar core or the, or the Jawar boundary. So all that together means that this map is not reproducible. It's not possible to actually know what the underlying error model for this map is. And furthermore, because this map was published in an era when it was a lot harder to share computer data, especially in publications, um, there's no underlying spatial like information. There's no spatial data sets, no shape files, no vector files, nothing that allows this map to be manipulated in a modern computer other than to use image analysis software because it just comes as a TIFF file, essentially. Um, so that's a problem because it means that it's a lot of work then to extract the data we need out of this map. Now, I know this example has gone on for quite a bit, but I just really want to emphasize the, the, the process here of thinking through reusability with regards to GIS. The authors in this case, they were not careless. They were excellent scientists, but this map was made in an age when reproducibility in the spatial sense wasn't really possible because computers weren't really the same that they are today. Today, if someone were to make a compilation map today like this, then it would be it, it would be not good for the utility of their research to not include some of the spatial metadata and the underlying spatial information uh, with this publication. Because today you can do that. You can you computers are fast enough now and storage devices large enough that you can share this information now. Um, so this is in no way to denigrate the excellent work done by Sabaro and Hooper, who did amazing here. Um, this is just to say I've spent a lot of time staring at this map because my undergraduate research was concerned with basically digitizing this map and using the information locked inside to better understand the depth of traps. And what I've done since then is, uh, in preparation for submitting this as a manuscript, is extract all this information and do some modeling to figure out how big the deck and traps actually are, given what we know about topography. Um, the key bit of inf information in my map that differentiates it from the Sabara Hooper map is the information on the projection and coordinate system. And this means that even if this map ends up, even if you know the computers, the servers storing this map end up destroyed and all that's left is a paper copy, there's a starting point for someone to know exactly what the underlying distortion was uh, involved in making this map. Whereas in the previous map, we have no idea what that distortion was from the first place. So by providing this little block of text here, I've ensured that future users will be able to access and you know, properly understand the meaning of this map and the error that it includes. Uh, furthermore, when this map is distributed, all the underlying shape files are going to be shared. So people won't have to go through the painstaking process of hand tracing the map, essentially, in GIS, a process called georeferencing, which we're going to do a lot more in session three and maybe, a, I think, in session two as well. Um, people don't have to georeference this map anymore. The shape files are there and they can manipulate them as they wish. So the key for this session, I know this was a, probably the longest of all of these blocks that I've talked about so far. The key is that GIS allows you and requires you to be transparent about the underlying uncertainty in your spatial data. Um, and by using GIS properly, 
you make your data more reusable. You, you make it so that that figure where you show, you know, where your samples came from in a particular geological formation, if you're treating this in a proper GIS way, you're making it so future people can extract those shape files exactly down to the smallest resolution possible. will know exactly where you got your material and they can validate your hypothesis. That is the real value of GIS in this application. I'll leave it at that for, for reproducibility and get to the final bit and that's storytelling and communication. So it should be unsurprising to all of you that I obviously favor maps for being a great way to get across information. Um, but you know, pretty much from, from very early periods of human history, maps and spatial uh, visualization forms were used to convey really complex information. They're a really compact way of getting across huge volumes of data that allow you to tell stories that are rooted in the place and time, and potentially the culture of the thing that you're studying or the site that you're assessing. Um, so you, leveraging GIS lets you get across your point in a much more powerful way. Uh, and we're gonna see that a lot through this course and the ways I'm gonna manipulate data. You'll see trends and, and observations jump out at you that may not have been obvious if we had just had a simple scatter plot. Um, the spatial element really adds a whole other rich layer to your data. A great way to get this across that I'll illustrate here, that doesn't concern this course as much, but is, is a great application of this principle, is the um, Esri product story maps. I'll talk about you know, geospatial softwares like ArcMap a bit more as we go through, through this course, but Esri is the parent company for ArcMap and, and is probably the premier geospatial technologies company. Um, while I tend not to favor them for teaching because of the pro proprietary nature of their software, undoubtedly they're the leader in the field and their story maps are a really great tool that lots of different organizations have taken on to, to basically share their data in a much more compelling way. Um, so I'm going to show you two examples of story maps, one from a big organization and one from a small organization that have very different goals, but leverage maps in such a way that really gives the data much more richness. Now, we're all familiar with coronavirus, unfortunately, at this point. Um, and we often see reports about daily case rates going up and, and you know, at least in the UK, about, um, you know, problems with regards to testing and mask wearing and whatnot. But that data can often feel quite sterile unless you have that spatial element to it. And so I've found throughout the pandemic, I've, I've always gone back to check the Johns Hopkins University COVID dashboard, which was assembled within, I'd say, about the, uh, the first month or so of the COVID pandemic breaking out. Um, and what this map does really well is it, in a very small space, it condenses all sorts of you know, case and death and vaccination information into a digestible map form with graphs on the side, interactive tabs, and sort of daily counts on the side. Now, often when we see news reports about these things, uh, we see these numbers reported. And these numbers on their own don't mean a lot. But when you put them in the spatial context where they're coming from, using, in this case, just a simple bubble graph, you really increase the ability of people to comprehend the scale of a problem or inequities in certain processes. If I had chosen to click on the vaccine uh, layer here rather than the, depth, the case layer, we'd see the huge global inequity of vaccinations starkly show up on this map. Um, and that's the power of maps. It allows you to get across your point uh, without having to add a lot of extra context. You can use the map to speak for you in many respects. Uh, this also means you have to be careful about how you make your map. This is something I'm going to emphasize a lot in the course, is that maps can be easily misunderstood or used for purposes that you don't intend because they are such powerful tools in conveying information. So you have to be really conscious about how you use a map for storytelling, especially if you're thinking something controversial like COVID, um, but there's nonetheless, they're still really powerful mediums for storytelling. And, and the next example is sort of much more pared down. It's actually an example that Esri uh, recommends for people who want to know more about the La Palma eruption. This was an exercise designed by a school in the UK to, uh, as a GCSE geography task, to understand La Palma Island and its volcanic history. Um, I think this task was designed much earlier in the year because it doesn't actually include information on the 
of the current extent of the lava flows that are still breaking out in La Palma. Uh, but what this map is showing in gray are the lava flows from previous eruptions, and in green and orange um, past landslide events, I believe, or land use, sorry, uh, land use events. <laughs> I, good, th good thing to clarify. Um, and also this little pin here is showing where the uh, Cumbre Vieja eruption uh, initiated. So, I mean, this is a really simple story map, but as used for GCSE geography activity, it allows the students to directly engage with the eruption and in particular see like where a lava flow is going. It's one thing to talk about the volume of lava coming out, how lava is made, but to allow students to explore the neighborhoods where that lava flow is going to run through or is currently running through is a much more powerful teaching tool than simply providing them a calculation sheet to work on. Um, I mean, this is still sort of my another one of my soapboxes, but maps are a great educational tool in this sense for providing people with a real context for the implications of a geological process. Um, so that's all I have for now for the reasons why you should care about GIS. I hope you've come away from the supplementary video with better appreciation for, you know, maybe wider eyes as to the ways you can use GIS to advance your career goals, improve your research, um, or enhance your teaching. Regardless of what you got out, you know, what specific things you got out of this video, I just hope you enjoyed kind of exploring some of the different uh, values that GIS can add to any sort of operation. Uh, that's all I have for now. So I'll see you in the next supplementary video or in the workshop on Wednesday. Have a great day.